Hello, adventurers. I'm Bruce. And I'm Ishin. In today's episode, we are embarking on a journey through time and history, exploring 10 ghost towns of New Mexico. Join us as we uncover the stories behind these deserted settlements. What do you think of when you hear the words ghost town? Hmm. I think of a completely deserted town with old buildings that are falling apart or nearly falling apart. Yeah, so do I, but that's not what we found. Most of the ghost towns we explored actually had people living in them. This led us to research the definition of what a ghost town actually is. A ghost town is a town that was once thriving, but is now nearly deserted or empty. Ghost towns are often the result of a natural resource being depleted. Other reasons for abandonment include economic activity shifting elsewhere, roads and railroads bypassing or no longer accessing the town, human intervention, disasters, massacres, and wars, the shifting of politics or the fall of empires, climate change, pollution, nuclear disasters such as Chernobyl. Ghost towns can be found on every continent. So, from this definition, we now know that ghost towns do not have to be totally abandoned. New Mexico's ghost towns, of which they are over 400, are remnants of the past, mostly born from the mining booms of the 19th century. When the mines dried up, so did the towns, leaving behind tales of misfortune, hardship, and misery. We explored nine ghost towns of Sierra County and one Hidalgo County. In this video, we explored the first eight, and then we explored the last two in our next video. There will be a link to that video at the end of this one. But first, we want to alert you to a little bonus tip that we will give you at the end of the next video that will help you to find ghost towns in your own area. Did you know that there are more than 3,800 ghost towns in the United States? I'll bet there is one near you. We'll show you how to find it. So look for that in the next video. What is it that attracts people to explore ghost towns? The western ghost towns are frozen in time and are silent witness to the once thriving mining and ranching era. These towns tell stories of boom and bust, endurance and the passage of time. Perhaps this is why so many people are drawn to them. We want to know why the towns were abandoned and what lessons we can learn and how to apply these lessons to our future. Whatever the reason, Ghost towns are fascinating. Let's get started exploring. An Englishman named Henry Pye, a mule skinner and prospector, was delivering freight for the U.S. Army from Hillsboro to Camp Ojo Caliente in 1879 when he discovered silver in a canyon where chloride is now located. After completing his freighting contract, he and two others returned to the area in 1881 and staked the claim. A tent city grew up nearby and then a town which was originally called Pie Town and then Bromide. The name chloride was finally selected after the high-grade silver ore found there because chloride hypochloride is used in the extraction process for this grade of silver ore. It became the center of all mining activity in the era, known as the Apache Mining District. During the 1880s, Kurai had 100 homes, 1,000 to 2,000 people, eight saloons, three general stores, restaurants, butcher shops, a candy store, a lawyer office, a doctor, 
boarding houses, an essay office, a stage line, hmm, a Chinese laundry, and a hotel. Residents even hoped the town would become the county seat. The Black Ranch newspaper operated there from 1883 until 1897. Apaches attacked the chloride store on January 18, 1881, killing two and injuring one. Henry Pye was killed by Apaches a few months later, apparently because his gun had jammed. About a half million dollars in silver and other ore was taken out of the mining district. There was a total of 480 prospector holes, including the least richest mine in the Apache mining district. Which was the Silver Monument, located about ten miles west of town, at the head of Chloride Creek. It produced about a hundred thousand dollars by 1893. Other mines in the area include the Great Eagle, the White Eagle, the U.S. Treasury, the Mayflower, the San Cloud, the Colossal, the Midnight, the Mountain King, the Wall Street, the White Mountain, and the New Era. Chloride and the surrounding area began to decline with the Silver Panic of 1893, when the country went on the gold standard, and silver prices dropped by about 90 percent. Area mines continued producing ore, mostly copper, lead, and zinc, from the turn of the century until about 1931. The post office was open until 1956. About 20 people still live in Chloride, including Mr. and Mrs. Don Edmond. They own a number of the old homes and buildings in town, and restored the Pioneer Store as a museum. Here are some photos taken from inside their museum. These are tools used by the local barber for performing dental work back in the 1800s. Wait a minute! You mean barbers performed dentistry in addition to cutting hair? Hmm. Yes, they did. But why? If anyone in our smart audience knows, please tell us in the comments below. Well, we will tell you what we found in our research. At the end of this video, do you remember the old radio your grandparents listened to? Perhaps it was just like this one from the 1920s. Originally. Called Fairview, the town was settled in 1880 to 81 by miners who found the area more agreeable than nearby Chloride. By 1884, it had 3,100 people, a school, a newspaper, horse races, and a bar, and it featured literary readings, plays, and sound fest. At Cloudman Hall, which was named for the local butcher, Willen Cloudman. Minor businessman and future state legislator Frank H. Winston moved to town in 1882. He eventually owned Fairview Cattle Company, Frank Winston Company General Merchandise, and the General Fairview Garage. He was a kind man, extending credit to customers during bad financial times. There were a number of saloons. Showing the prosperity this town once had in the past, when a miner made money, where did he go? It probably was a saloon. It was the place to get meals, get whiskey, and possibly spend time with women. 
When a miner was lucky to unearth a huge find, perhaps he spent a night at the poker table in the saloon, and perhaps by daybreak he may have turned back to being penniless, having to start from ground zero all over again. Unfortunately, this is all too common a story. Winston declined as silver prices dropped. By 1940, the population was about 400 and was down to 250 by 1946. Today, only a few families remain. Some old buildings still stand, including the school that was built in 1890. Frank Winston's home his carriage house and a store. A flood in the 1950 wiped out many other buildings. A community center was built by area residents in 1987, and there is a general store, a bar, and a chapel. The general store is still in operation today. Two prospectors, working as partners, discovered the site where Hillsboro stands. Dan Dugan and Dave Stitzel were working the east side of Black Range when Stitzel ran across some float that Dugan thought was worthless. Float is pieces of rock that have been broken off and moved from their original location by natural forces such as frost, floods, or glacier action. In other words, they floated down to where they were found, thus the name float. Stitzel disagreed with Dugan about its value and proceeded to hide a few samples that he had assayed when they returned to town. When Dugan heard the assay ran $160 a ton, he couldn't wait to file a claim. The news spread and soon there was a community of miners and prospectors. The inhabitants seemingly could not agree on a name for the settlement. It was decided to put names into a hat, and the first one draw would be the name of the town. By the luck of the draw, Hillsboro came into existence. Although not officially a ghost town, about 225 people still live there. Hillsboro has a rich history dating back more than 100 years. The town was founded in April of 1877, when the two prospectors discovered gold on the east side of Mimbers Mountain along Percher Creek. Dan Dugan and Dave Stitzel staked out the Opportunity and the Ready Pay mines. The Rattlesnake and the Bonanza mines came soon after. Despite fierce Indian attacks, the town grew. The post office opened in 1879 and never closed. The Hillsboro became the county seat in 1884. It grew to about 1,200 people by 1907. Area mines produced about six million in gold and silver. A slowdown occurred, however, and Hillsboro lost the county seat to truth or consequences in 1938. The remains of the old county courthouse built in 1892 still stand. It was here that the three alleged killer of Colonel Arbor J. Fontaine were tried for and acquitted of his 1896 murder. Hillsboro today is home to several restaurants, gift shops, and galleries, a museum, a garage, and a grocery, a bed and breakfast, a saloon, a library, a post office, and a bank. This house is probably where the restaurant owned by a fascinating woman named Sadie Orchard and her business partner, Tom Ying, was located. There is an interesting story about Tom Ying. We will share the link of the story at the end in case you are interested. Monticello is a ghost town with a different story. Many of the residents here were farmers and cattlemen rather than miners. When we were first approaching this town, we were surprised to see bright sparkling yellow leaves 
shining in the afternoon sun. We could imagine in one late fall afternoon, there were young lovers holding hands, walking by the stream, and the kids running around chasing the yellow leaves as they fell from these majestic trees. Now, most of the people are gone. The trees are left behind with these beautiful shining yellow leaves welcoming us. This is the remnant of the local school. Given the size of the school, we could imagine how many kids must have attended the school. The lettering on the front of the school indicates the school was built by the WPA. The WPA, or Works Progress Administration, was created in 1935 by President Franklin Roosevelt. The program's goal was to provide jobs and income for unemployed Americans during the Great Depression. Monticello was originally named Canada Alamosa, Spanish for Canyon of the Cottonwoods. It was settled by ranchers and farmers in 1856 and was built in a square to protect its residents from attack. Descendants of the original settlers still live and ranch in the area. The town was headquarters for the Southern Apache Agency before a post was established in nearby Ojo Caliente in 1874. About 500 Apaches lived at Canada Alamosa in 1870. Cochise and his Chiricahuas visited the area in 1871. Most of the Apaches were gone by 1877. The town was renamed to Monticello in 1881 by its first postmaster, John Sullivan of Monticello, New York. Monticello Cemetery is located on a hill northwest of the historic plaza. The mass is still celebrated at San Ignacio Catholic Church, or the Ignacio Church, which stands on the plaza, which was built in 1908. The original church was built in 1869. John Sullivan's home, an old stage stop, is now a private residence, the first in Sierra County. More than 1,000 families lived in Monticello Canyon, which contains both Monticello and Placita during its peak. Today, there are fewer than 100 families. Two miles south of Monticello, along the Canada Alamosa River, is Placita, or Little Plaza. It was settled in the 1840s by the Cedillo family, whose descendants still live there. San Lorenzo Church, built in 1916, and some of the town's original buildings, including the schoolhouse, a dance hall, and several homes, still stand. Cochillo was named for nearby Cochillo Negro Creek, or Black Knife Creek, which took its name from a local Apache chief. The town was established by ranchers and farmers in the 1850s and peaked between 1880 and 1930. Cochillo flourished as a trade center and stage stop. It was between the mines at Chloride and Winston and the railroad at Engel. It began to decline as the mines closed. A few original buildings still stand including the Cochillo Steward and Bar, which has many artifacts. Behind it are stables that housed mules and horses used to hold freight between Chloride, Winston, and Engel. Mass is still celebrated at San Jose Church, rebuilt for the third time in 1907 after being destroyed by floods. An abandoned dance hall is next door. Engel was built in 1879 as a station on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. It probably was named for R. L. Engel, a railroad construction engineer. 
it became a thriving cattle town and shipping point for ores and supplies. Construction of the Elephant Butte Den in 1911 to 1916 brought new jobs to Engel, which reached a population of about 500. However, the town declined after the den was completed. It had 200 residents in 1919 and only 75 people in 1926. The area east of town was restricted by the U.S. government when it created the Y. San Miso Ranch in 1945, and that spelled the end of Engel. The post office opened in 1881, was closed in 1955. A few people still live in Engel, and a few original buildings still stand, including the old schoolhouse where church services continued to be held. Headquarters for the Armendarez Ranch, now owned by Ted Turner, is in Engel, along with several vineyards. Trains still pass through town. Kingston first started as a silver mining camp called Perchak City, being located along Perchak Creek, where the first piece of rich silver ore was found in 1882. By the end of that year, the town had a population of 1,800, mostly miners and prospectors. The women, with the exception of the few miners' wives, were there to entertain the male population. The town did not have a church for some time. When one was built, the ratio was one church to 22 saloons. As the town grew, it also settled into a more peaceful existence, despite several unsuccessful Indian raids. What remains of Kingston makes for an interesting visit. Kingston was founded in August 1882, when miner Jack Sheldon discovered a rich load of silver ore at what would be one of the southwest most famous mines, the Solitaire. The town was named for another era mine, the Iron King. Other era mines were the Calamity Jane, the Black Hole, the Caledonia, and the Little Jimmy. Kingston was home to about 1,800 people in 1882. It peaked at more than several thousand. Some $7 million in silver was mined in the Black Range Mining District in the 1880s to 1890s. One of the wildest towns in the Wild West, Kingston once had 22 saloons, 14 groceries and general stores, gambling halls, a brewery, three newspapers, the Clipper, the Shaft, and the Advocate, restaurants, hotels, and theaters where actress Lillian Russell once performed. Albert Fall, later infamous in a Teapot Dome scandal, when he was Secretary of the Interior, was once a Kingston miner. Other famous visitors were Mark Twain, President Grover Cleveland, Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and Black Jack Ketchum. Sadie Orchard, a native of London, operated a brothel in Kingston on, of all places, Virtue Street, and later in Hillsborough. Kingston declined when the silver prices dropped and deposits ran out. The post office Closed in 1957, the Victoria Hotel, Percha Bank, and other old buildings still stand and they are 32 permanent residents today. A brass bell cast in 1877 and it used to call firemen and a sound mail call is still at the fire station on Main Street. Operating in Kingston today are Black Ranch Large Bed and Breakfast. Door Gallery, Jane's Windsocks, and the Camp Shulow. Okay, remember we talked about barber surgeons when we were in the Chloride General Store. Here is what our research revealed about them. In the medieval era, barber or barber surgeons were the only people who had a sharp instruments needed for shaving and trimming. At the time, Surgery was rarely performed by physicians, so barbers were often called upon for many tasks, including cutting hair, pulling teeth, 
amputating limbs, minor surgeries, bloodletting, and dressing wounds. Barbara and Barbara's surgeons were essentially the general practitioners of their day and were responsible for performing running repairs in the 15th century or earlier. They were essentially the equivalent of today's dentist. We have come to the end of part one of our fascinating exploration of some of New Mexico's ghost towns. You can watch part two by clicking right up here. Our thanks to Michael Cook and Henry Chenoweth for their research and contributions to the Hillsboro Historical Society, where much of our information came from. And as usual, please like, subscribe, and ring the bell so that you will be notified of our next adventure. See you! In the next video, well, we explore two true ghost towns.